say then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we just go on sinning so that God can keep forgiving us over and over? Paul said, certainly not. Absolutely not. So the question becomes, how do we move from where we see this promise, where we realize the promise is for me, if the Son makes you free, we'll be free indeed. How do we move from that understanding into a place where we're thinking free, walking free, living free, and being free? Come on. How many of you want to know the answer? to that question. Well, hold on to your hats because we're going to have to move a little quickly together today, all right? Because I'm going to give you five powerful strategic keys to help you live out your freedom, all right? The first one, I believe, is the most powerful one. All right, it's in the book of Romans chapter 6. And uh, first of all, we must accept the historical facts of our spiritual unity with Christ. Now, when the slaves were freed, way back with the Emancipation Proclamation, they had to ultimately look back, and even though it might have been a short time in history for them, they had to say, you know what? He signed the proclamation. I really am free. They had to believe something that was historical that was already done. Now, how many of you are with me today? Because you and I are in the same place. We've got to believe something that was already done in the past is touching us today. It's a historical fact of our unity with Jesus Christ. How many of you realize that there's a supernatural spiritual unity that happens to those who believe in Jesus Christ? All right. The scripture refers to us as in Christ. Uh, Paul gives this spiritual unity as a historical fact. How many of you tracking with me today? I'm going a little deeper than I normally do. So let me give you these three points today, all right? First of all, and we were crucified with him. We were crucified with him. That's what Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives within me, right? We were crucified with him. Our old man was crucified with him. We were buried with him. That symbolized best when we get baptized in water. We're buried with him. All right. And then we were raised to walk in newness of life. Just like Jesus was raised up from the dead, even so the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. He'll quicken our mortal body. The scripture says, come on, his power's in us so we can be raised up to walk in newness of life. And so I want to read a passage out of Romans 6. And really, I, as I got into this this week, I'm telling you, this is deep stuff. And it's good stuff. And it really needs for somebody to get a hold of it and study it deep, all right? But I want you to notice some things about this passage. I want you to notice the words united. And I want you to notice the words with him, all right? Paul gives this as a historical fact, all right? If you're going to live free from sin, you've got to believe that you are united with him, all right? Here we go. Let me read it. Romans 6, beginning at verse 2. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried, what's it say? With him. That's a spirit, that's a historical fact. We were buried with him, right? Through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been what? United. United together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man, now that's not talking about your pop, okay? That's right, this ain't your pop. Your old man is that, is that part of you that, that needs to die. Our old man, she was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, how many of you know a dead man doesn't sin? All right? Not much sinning goes on in the cemetery. Hello. Right? And this is saying we are dead with Christ. 
We were dead in trespasses of sin, sin, but now we're dead with Christ. Now it goes on to say, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. And so what Paul does here, Paul gives us the theological facts of our unity with Jesus Christ. I know it's kind of a deep passage, all right, but let me just give you this little bit here today. John Gregory Mantle wrote this. He said, there is a great difference between realizing, the how are you with me, on the cross he was crucified for me. That's realizing one thing, right? When we realize on the cross he was crucified for me, that means he died in my place. There's forgiveness for my sins there. There's, that's one level, okay? And he goes on to say there's a difference between realizing on the cross he was crucified for me and on that cross I am crucified with him. <laughs> That, that's what brings us deliverance from sin's condemnation. And what, excuse me. One aspect brings us deliverance from sin's condemnation and the other from sin's power. And so the key is we've got to accept by faith, how many of you are still with me, our unity, our unity with Jesus Christ. And then secondly today, we've got to believe the promise of freedom and reckon ourselves dead to sin. Now, Paul tells us uh, that, that, that this, he gives us this counsel, Romans 6, 11. He go, I'm just continuing the passage I just read. It says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, now the word reckon is not generally speaking a word. That we, that we talk about, you know, that we speak of, we don't generally, and maybe if you're really a Texan Texan or, or a country Texan, you know, if you wear boots like I do, you, you might say, well, I reckon, you know. But we really don't even know what that means, all right? So I, I want to jump into that. It's a very powerful word. And let me tell you, first of all, what it doesn't mean, all right? Back in the 1800s, there was a French psychiatrist who had a therapy that she espoused where she would try to get people to persuade themselves that something is true of them that was not actually true of them. In other words, if a person was afraid of dogs, all right, she would have this person walking around every day, all day long, saying, I'm, afra I'm not afraid of dogs, I'm not afraid of dogs, I'm not afraid of dogs. And the idea was that they would eventually convince themselves that they were not afraid of dogs, when in actuality they were. Let me tell you something, that is not what this scripture is all about. You are not walking around around saying, you know what, I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to sin, I'm dead to sin. But really, in reality, you're really, really alive to sin, but you're just trying to convince yourself. That's not what this is all about, okay? That's not what this is saying. This is saying, now how many of you are with me, all right? On the basis of my unity with Jesus, on the basis of the historical fact that I am crucified with Christ, that my old man died with Christ, that I'm united with him in his death, Death, burial and resurrection I'm going to reckon that I am dead to sin now that's completely different there's a basis for what you believe in all right and the word reckon means this are you ready it means to consider and come to a conclusion to consider and come to a conclusion. So what we do in the spiritual realm, how many of you are with me? We consider our unity with Jesus, that we were with him when he died, was buried, and when he rose again. And we develop a conclusion about our lives, and that is that we are free from sin. Come on, somebody. We've just got to believe it. We've got to believe that it's real. So when sin presents itself, we are able to tell ourselves, listen, on the basis of the historical fact that I'm united with Jesus Christ, amen, I am dead to sin. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise today. Amen. And then there's something else we've got to do, right? Number three, we've got to set our mind on the things of the Spirit. It's essential for the Christian life. Romans tells us that we're to be transformed by what? The renewing of our mind. 
right? Just because you become a Christian, that doesn't mean that all of the programming that you have been programmed by, by the world, by your flesh, by the devil, that doesn't mean it's all erased and, and you get an upload or a download of a brand new uh, system. No, 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 no. You've got to rewire your mind. You've got to refocus your mind. You've got to, uh, you know, uh, renew your mind. And I'll tell you what the chief agent for that is. The Word of God. <laughs> hey, you won't be able to do it without the Word of God. And it doesn't just take, well, you know there was somebody that published something called the One Minute Bible a few years back. The One Minute Bible. I'm sorry, but I don't want a One Minute Bible. Hello? I, I, let me tell you why. Because my mind needs more renewing than one minute. I don't even need a 15-minute Bible or a 30-minute Bible. I need to get in the Word as much as I can in order for it to change my mind. And scientists have discovered how the mind works. The more you think a thought, it's like it creates a superhighway of neural networks in your mind. They've even done a study recently where they'll have people just tap their fingers, right? A simple rhythm, they'll just tap their fingers and they'll, they'll, they'll notice in the brain that it activates a certain part of the brain. But the harder and the more, if they do that for several weeks and they learn how to use, play certain rhythms and do certain things with tapping their fingers, all of a sudden they'll notice that almost the entire brain begins to light up as those neural networks begin. I'm just here today to tell you that you can renew your mind by the word of God if tapping your fingers does that to your mind just think about what an hour of listening to the word of God would do what, a, what, what moments in praise and worship as you dwell upon the Lord by the spirit come on can do in your heart amen and the thing of it is you and I have the ability to set our mind it's almost like you can change the channel of your mind. You can put your, your mind on the things that, you know, your flesh wants. You know what? Your flesh is that part of you that is a part of your sinful nature, and it wants what it wants. And so if you set your mind to that channel, you will think that way. And ultimately, the Scripture says it will lead to death. Let me tell you how Paul put it here in Romans chapter 8. He said, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So, <laughs> well, someone said to me, Pastor Bob, I, I can't help what I think. And that's true to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, you can't help it if a thought fl flashes through your mind. You cannot help that. But the Scripture tells us that we're to do what? Take every thought captive. We're to grab a hold of that thought and say, uh-uh, I'm not going to think about that, right? Uh, the old saying is this, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can certainly stop it from making a nest in your hair, Right? And that's the difference. You can't stop a thought from flitting through your mind, but you can tell yourself, no, I'm not going to think about that. Take it captive and switch gears and set your mind on something else. Now, here's what I have found out and what I have learned in my spiritual life, in my spiritual disciplines, and that is this, that I have to set my mind on the things of God every single day. I've got to do it every day. I can't just skip a week. I can't skip two weeks or a month. I, I've got to set my mind on God every single day. And I'll tell you how I do it. I get up in the morning and I might listen to David Wilkerson preach on YouTube. Or I might listen to uh, Stephen Furtick preach on YouTube. Or, or, or I might read the Word or I might enjoy some praise and worship and spend time in prayer. But what I am doing is I am setting my mind and I'm programming my mind and my heart and my will and my emotions and I'm saying to the Lord you know I need to connect with you I, I want to be connected because how many of you realize when you abide in the vine my friend that's when the life of God flows into you